Fantastic. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Congresswoman Jennifer Wexton, and I'm delighted to be hosting this, uh, this digital roundtable, this virtual roundtable on families and screen time in the digital era. We have some amazing guests here joining us today. Uh, first of all, I'm joined by my colleague from the DMV, Jamie Raskin. Hello, Congresswoman Wexton. By John Hyatt, who's the director of the new film Screen Now, which premiered just this week. Hey, everybody. Dr. Michael Rich, MD and MPH, who's the director of the Center on Media and Child Health at Boston Children's Hospital. Hello. Dr. Jenny Radeski, MD, who's from University of Michigan's CS Mott Children's Hospital. Hi. And Jim Steyer, the founder of Common Sense Media, who does a ton of work in this space. Fantastic, really valuable work. Thanks for Great to be here. Thanks, Jennifer. So I, I founded the Congressional Task Force on Digital Citizenship. Uh, it's become clear that the digital world impacts our, our real lives every single day in every aspect of our lives. And as members of Congress, we have an obligation not only to legislate in this area, but also to raise awareness. And one of the things that it really tends to impact is, is as a mom of two teenagers, I have seen how they really are you know, if not addicted, they are really dependent on their screens. And I know they're not alone. There's an entire generation who are so dependent on their screens. And the impact of social media is also very real among our adolescents. Now we don't know what impact this is gonna have on their long-term brain development, on their communication skills, things like that. So my colleague, Jamie Raskin, will probably talk a little bit more about some work that he's been doing in that area, uh, as these doctors will as well. So I wanna just have an open discussion about the impact of digital uh, social media and, and devices on our kids and their development and kind of ways that we can raise awareness about what, what's actually going on. So with, without further ado, I'd like to toss it to my colleague from the DMV, Representative Jamie Raskin. Jennifer, thank you so much. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you and this extraordinarily distinguished panel you've put together uh, and thanks for creating the new task force on digital citizenship, which I joined right away when I got my email. So um, thank you for doing that. And uh, it's a pleasure working with you on this. And I think we're picking up some real momentum in terms of talking about the problem of the uh, effect of social media on the developing brains of children. Um, of course, that's a subset of the broader issue of how it um, relates to all of our cognition and emotion and so on. I mean, uh, in just the last 24 hours, the president decided to issue an executive order, basically trying to invade the First Amendment rights of, of Twitter and Facebook and the social media companies because he didn't like the fact that they were fact checking him and uh, adding a factual counterpoint to uh, whatever particular paranoid fantasies he was putting out that day. So, um, I mean, we're, we're in the infancy of this new technology. And as with TV and radio, we're trying to figure out how to regulate it so um, it can serve the public interest rather than all of us just serving the new technology. So I am the sponsor of the Camera Act, which I inherited from my uh, colleague, John Delaney, who you know ran for president. Um, but I, I love the legislation and I was happy to take it over because it'll authorize the NIH, which is in my district, to lead a comprehensive research study program on technology and on the social media's effect on childhood development on the brains and the hearts of kids. And this is not a moralistic thing, nor is it some kind of a religious crusade against computers. It's an attempt for us to try and figure out how do we successfully integrate the new technologies in a way that advance decent, humane child development, um, as well as a, a pluralistic and safe and egalitarian society. So. Um, as screen time replaces playtime in the digital age, we need more data and we need more research on how technology is influ influencing our children's development. It's remarkable to me that we haven't done such a study yet. It's not that expensive. It's not that big a deal. We can do it, but it would be great to have some real science and some real data there. And I just want to thank uh, Jim Steyer and Common Sense Media for their uh, extraordinary dedication to advocating for the health and wellness of kids. Um, in the new age and keeping their eyes on the prize in terms of that. So I've got some other thoughts and things to say, but I wanna see how things unfold here. 
and I'm just delighted to be with you, Jennifer. And thanks for co-sponsoring my golf group. Thanks, Stevie. I'm glad to co-sponsor it. I'm just jealous I didn't think of it sooner, but I feel better knowing that it came from, from Delaney, so you inherited it. <laughs> um, well, let's give our panelists, some, uh, panelists a moment to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about why they're here, starting with you, John. Um, I'm, I really, really enjoyed Screened Out. I hope that we can talk about that a little bit more during the course of this discussion. But if you would just tell the viewers a little bit about how you became, came to be here this, morning, this afternoon. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm John Hyde. I'm a film director and producer. And we made uh, the film's documentary film Screened Out, which addresses um, the problem with um, you know, overuse of uh, or excessive screen use in children, uh, but also in adults. Um, and we, you know, we look at myself in the film um, and what I went through getting off screens and then how we kind of regulate it for my oh. children. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that, 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 that was our sound effect. <laughs> I'm going to mute, I'm going to mute our dogs, forgive me. <laughs> Here we are on screen. We're in the backyard, I think. So hopefully they will. COVID world, people. Um, but yeah, so you know, we made this. We made this film, and uh, and uh, we we started to do an in impact campaign as well. And uh, we got involved with, with Camera Act, and uh, just thought it was an incredible piece of uh, legislation. And seeing all the work that went into it, we just we just had to be involved. Great. Thanks so much. Dr. Rich, if you would tell a little bit about your involvement in this space. I know that you appear in the documentary uh, and have some great things to say. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, wonderful to be here. Um, as, as some of you may know, but many people do not, um, this, this is the second round for the camera bill. The camera bill first uh, was uh, developed in 2004. Um, and back in the days when it was Hillary Clinton and Joe Lieberman and, um, and Sam Brownback who were developing it. And so I am hopeful that this time through, uh, people will realize the importance of really understanding the environment in which our children are growing up now. Uh, it, this is more than just a single issue. This is more than just a single study. This is like understanding um, the air they're breathing and the water they're drinking and how that influences their physical, mental, and social health, um, which uh, we have been studying at the Center on Media and Child Health at Boston Children's Hospital now for 18 years. Um, so we are very hopeful that this time through, we will be able to get um, a really balanced, thoughtful look at how we can live in this digital environment and raise children in this digital environment in ways that will help them be uh, stronger, smarter, and kinder. Thank you so much, Dr. Rich. And that, that certainly is exactly why I thought it was necessary to start the, the task force on digital citizenship. So I'm glad that we're all working in the same direction. Dr. Rudesky, tell us a little bit about what you're, the, what you're working on. Thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to contribute to this conversation. Um, so I am a developmental behavioral pediatrician at the University of Michigan. Um, I'm a media researcher, so I have a couple NIH-funded studies looking at parents' use of mobile media around kids, um, early childhood use of mobile and interactive media and their executive functioning, um, and development of new technologies that help us track what kids are doing on their devices directly from the data we get there from their devices. Um, so I'm, I'm so excited to, to talk about the camera uh, bill because I helped write the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines in 2016. I realized how limited some of our prior research is. It's all on TV and videos and, and mobile devices are just a new beast entirely. Um, and I also found it frustrating to be trying to help parents navigate new guidelines about how to use media in their homes when there's so much about the design of media that dictates how we use it and how it uses us. So um, I loved you know, being able to hear that message through Screened Out also, how much we need to pay attention, not only to what families are doing, but also to what the designers are doing. Thank you so much. And Jim Steyer, the founder of Common Sense Media. You're really a pioneer in this area. If you could talk a little bit about what you guys have been doing. Well, thank you so much for having us, uh, Jennifer and Jamie. Um, so uh, actually, it's really interesting that Michael mentioned the 2004 Camera Act and Jamie, that John Delaney at that point was my brother's business partner and April and John opened our Washington office. So there is a link between the 2004 Camera Act that was Brownback and Hillary 
and and the fact that uh, John, when he went went into Congress, introduced it with his wife pushing him the whole way. I will tell you, um, but he's been a, he's a great, he's a really good guy. You know, it's interesting. Um, I'm so glad to see camera coming. As great researchers like Jenny and Michael know, there's a there's a dearth of research on brain development, on the impact of media and technology on kids and society, uh, which is why camera is so important. It's such a no-brainer, if you will. Um, you, we spend at Common Sense now probably a couple million dollars a year. Common Sense is about 16 years old. We probably spend a couple million dollars a year funding people like Jenny Radeski to do really important research. And that makes us one of the largest research institutions in the country. That's crazy. We should be spending hundreds of millions of dollars because our kids are literally, as John's movie makes clear, living in front of screens and their lives and their behavior and their entire uh, raison d'etre is being shaped daily by screen, social media platforms, et cetera. You know, the interesting thing is I'm so glad that you created that digital citizenship committee because that's another part that I think Common Sense feels uniquely proud of. About 11 years ago, um, I met, and I happen to be a Stanford professor, so I'm sorry to people who don't like the West Coast, but we got together with a professor at Harvard named Howard Gardner, one of the most famous child development education people ever, and thought he was doing research on the impact of, uh, of, of technology on ethical decision-making by young people. And Howard is one of the most famous, we have Michael and Jenny, everybody knows one of the most famous researchers ever. And he said, Jim, you're not particularly intelligent. So why don't you take my research and dumb it down for the masses? That's what common sense does. And that was actually the beginning of the digital citizenship curriculum that we created with Howard 11 years ago. That's in, we now have 90,000 member schools so about 25 million kids in the United States currently take a digital citizenship curriculum in their school, K through 12, that was created in a partnership between Common Sense and, and, and the Harvard Grad School of Education. So it couldn't be more timely. A, digital citizenship at a time like COVID-19 where all of us are in front of screens more than we wanna be is critical, but also camera is so important. It's such a nonpartisan issue, such a obvious no brainer for everybody. So thank you so much for getting us together. I'm, Really psyched to have this conversation, but also to pass camera once and for all. Thanks, Jim. I think we all can agree on that. Hopefully, we'll get enough of our colleagues to agree as well, Jamie. Yeah. So, John, I want to start with you. What what led you to to create Screened Out? What makes you feel so passionate about this? So, I have, uh, I have three young boys, and you see them in the film, and uh, they were having issues detaching from screens. Um, you know, they always want to get right back on them right away. They never wanted to get off them. I'm sure every parent watching understands this problem. And, you know, sometimes they would just freak out, you know, when you took the screens away from them. Um, but then I didn't notice it in just my own kids, but in like every child in the neighborhood who was doing the same thing. Um, and then I spoke to my brother who has four kids and he said, you know, I'm reading a few books on, you know, screen addiction and uh, you, should, you should read about that. And I did, and we were making a horror movie at the time, funny enough. And we said, this is the movie. Like, this is terrifying, what's going on? And um, basically, we started looking at resources, uh, one of them being Common Sense Media. And my Lord, I mean, the amount of research that Jim and his team has done over the years has just been fantastic. You know, you could just go down that hole and stay there. Um, uh, and then, you know, we looked at uh, Dr. Michael Rich and, you know, and, and, uh, and parent uh, groups that were started by parents at Screen Strong and really just got some great information. And then I said, whoa, wait a second. What about me? I'm looking at my phone 150 times a day, you know? I'm looking at Facebook. I can't get off Instagram. You know, my kids are talking to me and I'm not even looking at them. I'm not paying them attention. So I said, you know, this is a bigger problem than just children. This is everyone. And, uh, and that's when, you know, I decided to go out and get some answers. And one of the things that I found so fascinating in the film was the discussion of how the social media companies, um, how, how we as the subscribers are not the, the customers for the social media companies. We're, the, we're actually the product. The customers are the advertisers. Mm -hmm. And so it's in their interest to keep us, to keep us, our eyeballs on the page for as long as they can. So they create these social validation feedback loops and we have a couple clips that I was hoping we could show. Can we show those? First of all, starting with Sean Parker's clip. Yes, we can. Do we have audio? 
You may need to be your microphones too, guys, or it'll feedback. Oh, I'm sorry. Is the is the audio not playing? It's not playing. Okay, one second. Okay, oh, there we go. Sean Parker, ex-president of Facebook, in a rare interview broke his silence and spoke about how they manipulated us all along into becoming behaviorally addicted to their products. That thought process was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while um, because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. And that's going to get you to contribute more content and that's going to get you, you know, more likes and comments. I mean, it's, a, it's, a val it's a social validation feedback loop. You're exploiting a vulnerability in, in human psychology. The inventors, creators understood this consciously and we did it anyway. Now, um, Mark Zuckerberg went and testified before the Senate uh, shortly thereafter and said, oh, no, we don't do that at all. So whom, whom should we believe, I guess, is the question, Jim? Well, here's the thing. Uh, so I saw my friend Roger McNamee uh, quoted there at the end of, of that little clip from Sean, who I, we've met with many times. You know, I've had this conversation with Mark and Cheryl at Facebook many times. I wrote a book called Talking Back to Facebook in 2012 that they did not like. Um, which basically said that they are manipulated, that this is a conscious design technique. And by the way, what really happened, and my colleague Roger and a couple other guys we've worked with, Tristan Harris and some others, who are former employees, basically whistleblowers, along with Sean, came out probably about five years ago and said, oh, no, no, this is completely intentional. All of the, many of the different product design elements are designed to addict you and keep you the screen. We, you know, I've, I've, uh, since we're based in, we're headquartered in San Francisco, we deal with the people who run all the big tech companies frequently. And we've had many conversations with everybody from Reed who runs uh, Netflix to the guys who run Google, mm -hmm. Facebook, YouTube, et cetera. And they now openly acknowledge that their engineers built product design factors in that are designed to keep you. The simplest one that I would give to everybody is the uh, three, two, one next episode. So you think you're gonna one, watch one uh, sh uh, 30 minute show on Netflix and six hours later, you've been watching 12 episodes. So many of the features are absolutely, what Sean is saying is so obvious. I don't think Mark would even deny that anymore because how many of his engineers have come out and admitted that? The guy who designed the like button was part of our anti-addiction campaign. And a lot of the guys who left the industry have been coming out and saying, this is not, a, they've become parents. Remember a lot of them are like 24 year olds when they designed the features and they're not parents. So. Jennifer, this is so, no question, it, there is absolutely no question that the features were designed in, in, in that way to detect people. You can have a dis discussion with a doctor like Michael or Jenny if you call it addiction or not, I do. But the truth is, it is addicting our kids. It is addicting adults, as, as you said, John, all of us, and it needs to be dealt with and we need to educate the public about it, period. Jennifer, can I pose a question to these guys? Sure. Um, so, so John, in the, the documentary, um, you interview um, a number of experts in tech, people like Jim is describing, people whose lives are around this. They understand uh, the way that all of these cognitive uh, tricks and marketing techniques are built into the technology, and they don't want it for their own kids. And I think you interview a teacher from the Waldorf School in the Silicon Valley who says they don't allow kids to go anywhere near computers until they're 14 years old. Right. They want to give them an upbringing and education uh, without the domination of computers and marketing and commercialization and so on. Um, is there a new digital divide developing where there are some people who understand this, who understand the dangers and the perils 
of screen addiction and they're shielding their kids from it or at least trying to create a balance. And then other people are just continue to be the victims of it and are just the subjects of the big, the mass media, social media companies. Yeah, well, I think that that's absolutely true. And, and, you know, not all executives send their kids to these schools, but a bunch do. And it's funny when you, you know, it's that famous uh, quote from Steve Jobs where, you know, he did the, the New York Times article, which I can't remember which one it was, but at the very end, he's just like, we don't let our kids use technology at home. And that tells you something um, about, about these devices. Uh, and you know, the, what they said at the Waldorf School, which is really interesting and has always resonated with me, you know, I think that they understand that to be a good creator, you need to have a balanced life where you create things and you do different things during the day. I know Michael Rich, uh, Dr. Michael Rich talks about this, about, you know, having a balanced day um, and doing different things and not just, you know, being on screens all day. But they realize that to be a good creator, you need to learn how to create first and not just go down these, uh, these pathways that have been designed for you. Well, Dr. Rich, let me follow up with you. The, the purpose of the Camera Act is to get some scientific governmental research on this whole problem. And uh, let's let the chips fall where they, well, you know, wherever they may. You know, we might learn that certain um, technologies are great for learning, you know, and I would like to know that. And that would be useful for educators to know. And there might be other things which are a nightmare for emotional development or intellectual development or moral development. Um, but give us a preview of what you think we will find based on your own research, if you would, doctor. Well, I think to give a preview of what I think I will find will mean that I'll go into this research with preconceptions. And I think the most important thing we should do is go in without preconceptions and, and really understand what's going on. We spend mm -hmm. billions of dollars in both research and programs to understand and protect what we feed our children's bodies. So we can walk down a grocery store aisle and know exactly how much sodium, how much cholesterol we're putting into our kids' bodies. We have none of that for what we're feeding our children's minds. And we, we need to invest in the, the children who are going to be the future of our society um, and really understand what we're feeding their minds the way we seek to understand what we're feeding their bodies. So, um, I think what we will find is a much more nuanced um, understanding than we have now. I think we're stuck now between uh, confusion and fear, and we are seeking a binary answer to a complex question. Um, so I, I don't think that the solution is to keep all screens from children until they're 14 years old um, because they are going to be in a cohort of kids who are very adept with technologies uh, that can use be used to learn, to connect, to um, develop connections around the world with each other. And I, I think that to damn the technology as all bad or all good um, denies us the opportunity to use something like social media um, to create a global citizenry. I mean, I, I, I have this belief that social media, if we learn to use it right, and we are not using it right yet, um, can be a, an instrument of peace in the sense of, you know, kids around the world whose, whose leaders are fighting with each other saying, wait a minute, I, I know this 14 year old in Iran um, way better than I know the guy in the White House who's telling me he's my enemy. Why would I seek to you know, be his enemy? So mm -hmm. I, I really think we have to take a step back and not approach it with those preconceptions, mm -hmm. not approach it with the goal of getting a yes, no answer to a nuanced question. Okay, yeah, I, and one final question, Jennifer, for Dr. Rudesky, and then I will leave it back to you. Yeah, no, that's cute. Uh, but um, Dr. Rudesky, the, you know, following up then on Jim's point, um, you know, if we don't know exactly what we're going to find and we're going to follow wherever the research goes, help me, art and help me and Jennifer articulate to our colleagues why it's important for us to get this information so we're aware, because we're dealing in a time now, uh, obviously, of uh, an out of control pandemic, pandemic that's threatening everybody's life. We've got economic depression okay. spreading, 38 million people unemployed and so on. And a lot of people would see this as uh, 
you know, pre-coronavirus, like, well, this is something we might have done then, but at this point, uh, it's a luxury to invest in something like this. Why is this actually uh, essential for us to do? I mean, I think the coronavirus pandemic has made it so clear how, how crucially we're also dependent on technology and how the design of that technology can either support all of our human goals and values and how we need to connect with one another, how we need to learn, or it can undermine us. It can drag us into a feed that, you know, of, of autoplay where we don't get to sleep as much as we need to. And sleep is the most important thing for your immune system amongst, you know, other healthy behaviors. So this idea of reliance on a technological ecosystem that isn't designed with all of our best human interests in mind is probably one of the most concerning things that the Screened Out documentary brings up that it's been designed with a business model that really you know, rewards engagement and prolonged um, use of media because that's how either app developers or platforms make money off of advertising or the data that they're collecting about us. So I think that number one, the urgency is not only about the kind of moral panic and worry that families have about what to do, I don't know what to do, I need better evidence-based guidance. It's also about how much we, we clearly see how interwoven this is in our emotional lives, our economic lives, our political lives, and it needs to be designed well. Otherwise, it's going to be so much harder um, to, to, do, to create healthy relationships with media for our kids. And I would say just to add to what Dr. Rich said, the NIH brings a degree of rigor to research both through its study sections. I've sat on a couple of study sections and it is so intense, the amount of detail and making sure this is good science. It's not just people, like Michael said, approaching a research study with a preconceived you know, conception that screens are bad or screens are, are good. So, so there's rigor. There is um, your peers are the ones helping evaluate you. So you have, you have a, a body of really established media scientists now who will be able to help evaluate whether this is worth funding. Um, and number two is that they like innovation, right? So we should be moving past the screen time debate and we should be going to better measures, better uh, you know, methods that really help capture what does the child bring to the table? We know that not all kids are gonna develop you know, the same type of relationship with media. Some are gonna have more problems than others. We need to know that. Which of our kids should we be worried about and which ones can we be a little bit more lax with? Um, so I think that's where the NIH funding really um, elevates the science, elevates our confidence in the science, and let, then lets also parents <laughs> stop worrying as much. Um, and, and so I think th those, are, those are my arguments. I'd say, um, you know, when it comes to rigor, my, my approach has been trying to see where child developmental needs and tech design mismatch. So that, that example Jim gave of the countdown, the three, two, one, here comes your next episode, is just a perfect example of undermining parent limit setting or undermining your own autonomy to turn it off and self-regulate. So, you know, I've found so many examples like that so far. Is there a way to opt out of those three, two, one, you know, here's your next video sort of thing? Uh, it's easier on some platforms than others. You know, YouTube created a toggle right there on the top, so you can you can opt out. It's harder with other streaming platforms, though. But you'd, you'd have to affirmatively take F, take pains to to find the way to opt out. I mean, yes. you're automatically opted in. Same. And I'm sure parents feel a lot of mental space for that sort of thing right now. So, you know, I'd love for some of these settings to be the default to help with families finding a better relationship with media. But if you hear what, Jay, uh, what uh, Jenny's saying, first of all, we have been conducting for the past decade or more the biggest real-time experiment on our kids' lives in the history of humankind with virtually no research and data. So think about this. You guys are important public policy makers. How can you make thoughtful public policies on anything like Section 230, by the way, Jamie, that this is Trump raised for us now? Um, and or, or about all the different ways that you might and probably should regulate various different social media platforms without evidence. Second, what we found, and by the way, we are the people who went to Susan and the people who run YouTube and told her to her face on most, and, who, and who was responsive, by the way, that you have to provide a way to, to opt out of the automatic auto replay. Reed did not do that, by the way, at Netflix. Shame on him because he's an educator and he should know better. But the truth is, research like camera is proposing allows you to have a really thoughtful public policy strategy it allows you to have really thoughtful 
uh, uh, business strategies where you can go to the people who run the companies because they're the decision maker in essentially unregulated environment that we live in and show them the research in terms of the impact on their own children, not to mention tens of millions of other people's kids. But third, it allows you as a mom, Jennifer, or me as a dad of four kids to talk to my own kids about the reality. And it's one, it's one thing for us to conjecture, but it's another thing for somebody like Michael, to, who's an expert on this, to be able to lay out the impact that this can have. Because that helps educate parents and educators. You can force the industry to change by showing them the research, and you guys can construct good public policy. So the importance of data and, and impartial research, like Michael and Jenny are saying, cannot be overstated. And we need to pass this bill now and fund this kind of research, period. And the awareness is so important because I think it was brought up in the film, John, one of the people was saying that kids don't like to feel like they're being taken advantage, taken advantage right. of, like they're stupid. Mm -hmm. and that's exactly what, you know, what some of these social media companies do with them. But one of the things that's really concerning to me is the impact of, of social media on kids and adolescents. Um, the film talks some about the, not just the impact on their brains, but the impact on their well-being. And um, one, of the, one of the people in the film talked about how the more time that kids are spending on social media, the more anxious they are, the more, the more restless they are, the more they're distressed. And, uh, and you know, some of the, some of the, some, some of the kids in the, in, the, in the film talked about FOMO, you know, the fear of missing out even when they weren't on social media. And, and the young lady, uh, the, her story, how she was feeling depressed, so she went to Insta and looked up looked up depressed and then got more depressed and ended up on a ledge uh, ready to jump. I mean, that's, that's terrifying to me as a mom. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the young man who, for the, for the doctors, um, the young man who, who, uh, who said that after he finished his homework and everything, he would just go on to check Instagram really, really short for like a short amount of time. And then before he knew it, he was up all night watching you know, videos and, and looking through everybody else's life. So not getting the sleep that they need. And May is Mental Health Awareness, Mental Illness Awareness Month. And with kids, you know, with the increase in teen suicides, I'm very concerned about the ultimate, you know, impact on their well-being and health from all this reliance on social media. Is that something that you think the Camera Act could help um, get us some, some clear metrics about and clear studies? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that one of the things that really needs to be looked at is the relationship between human brain development um, and these media. Um, we have to recognize that these kids um, do not have fully formed executive functions um, in their, their prefrontal cortex is not going to finish developing until mid to late 20s. And the people who figured this out from a business sense long before the neuroscientists did were the car rental companies, you know, that, that wouldn't rent you a car until you were 25, because that's where the actuarial tables actually cross between the risk and benefit to them of actually getting that car back. Um, and so I, I, I think that we need to take a step back and say, uh, understand that these kids are not fully formed, that in, in a way it is taking advantage of them by putting them in a situation that exploits their impulse control, that exploits their inability to um, create a, a clear stop point in their lives. And, and I think that social media in particular is, is tough, not just because of FOMO, um, with adolescents, but what I call faux blow, which is fear of being left out, fear of not being in the dialogue. And so these kids will not tell their parents or teachers or adult figures in their lives if they're being cyber bullied or if sexting is occurring or things like that, because they're afraid that what will happen is their parents will take that device, take that access away, which the parents see as a vector of harm but the kids see as their line of defense and their line of awareness. So I think we have to really look at three moving targets in a very scientific way. One being the development from infancy through adolescence to adulthood. We have to look at the constantly evolving electronic or digital environment in which that development is occurring and which is stimulating and responding to that development. And the third is the change in all of our behavior because of that. 
We behave entirely differently because we have smartphones in our pockets than we did before smartphones existed. And we have to understand that that is part of that milieu in which the child is figuring out how to be in this world and how to succeed in this world. I think that was really well said, Michael, and that the, you know, being an early childhood researcher, I care so much about those early years of concept formation when kids learn informally about the world. What is the, what are the norms? You know, how, how am I supposed to use these objects that interact back and have all my favorite shows on them? So by watching their parents, right, we're, we're creating norms and informal learning opportunities for our kids. Um, but also the devices themselves teach kids informally about what they should like and what should be the norm. I think we're finding that kids are, they're used to advertising. They come to expect it because it's just packed into so much of what they do already. Um, and they also pick up on hints from the design of media too that make them a little bit more savvy. So we really need to know a lot more about that early childhood, you know, mix of children's, you know, burgeoning executive functioning, their temperaments, um, how difficult they are to parent, and then the design of media that they're, that they're using, and which kids may have the biggest vulnerabilities towards developing more problematic media use habits that get in the way of their functioning or their sleep, um, or they have those, you know, kind of dramatic uh, uh, behaviors when the technology is taken away. And I was thinking, as you were talking about that social desirability feedback loop, like little kids don't have that, right? Because they don't have social networks yet. What they have is just such um, susceptibility to rewards, right? So all the apps that we're analyzing in my research lab involve coins and stickers and virtual toys and spin the wheel of surprise eggs. And it's just all this gimmicky um, reinforcement that kids are just eating up and it, it extends their viewing time and extends their usage, right? So the, the apps get more um, ad revenue but it is just such a shallow type of tech experience. And I'd love to kind of know more about whether those types of, you know, sticky engagement promoting design aspects are contributing to some of the problematic media use we see. Dr. Rich, in the, in the film, you talk about how, you know, cause we, we talked a little bit earlier in the discussion and I know Jim was saying that he thinks it's addiction and, and John probably too. And I know that, you know, we've got the dopamine effect, we've got the irritability when it's taken away, you know, we've got a lot of the things that are dependency related. And I know that, that you mentioned in the film, and I found it very persuasive. Um, you know, when you say addiction, if you say that to the parents of a lot of these kids, they're going to shut right down and say, that's not my kid. So instead, you rephrase it as that their child is having trouble regulating their, their relationship with screens or, or how they deal with screens. Can you talk a little bit about some of the stigmas that you're seeing or some of the issues that you see in regard to how people view what their kids are doing? Absolutely. I mean, I think the word addiction is great for uh, getting attention. It's a great lightning rod, but both from a medical perspective and I think from a functional perspective, I think it does more harm than good. Um, if you think of addiction as we understand it to say heroin or tobacco or cocaine, um, you're dealing with a substance that is put in the body, which makes a physiologic change in the body, um, both when they're using and then after they've been a user, when they're withdrawing from it. Um, and we don't have that with this. These, this is a behavioral uh, issue. And there's been a long running debate in medicine about whether behavioral stuff can be called addictions or not, whether it's to gambling or sex, et cetera. So I think that moving that aside, as a pediatrician dealing with a, a moving target of the developing child rather than a fixed entity of an adult, um, I think that what ends up happening is that that word does turn parents off. They, they think of junkies, they think of bums on skid row, they don't think their 10 year old who's having a hissy fit because he's got to stop playing Fortnite um, and go to bed is the same thing. And so what happens is that they don't bring that child to care. Um, and, and I think that a better parallel than addiction is binge eating disorder, um, where it's overuse of a necessary resource. Um, it is overuse to the point where negative consequences are occurring. And the goal with treating real addiction is abstinence. 
And the reality is they cannot be abstinent from the interactive media environment. They need it for schooling, they need it for relationships, they need it for communication now. And so the goal is really to get to a place of self-regulation. And unfortunately, when we think of addiction and put it together, bunch it together, it also creates such a, a stigma that parents are ashamed or feel guilty and, and et cetera. So their tendency is to shut it down, not let anybody know about it until the kid has gotten to the point where they're so out of control, they end up having to come to somebody like me to you know, kind of reclaim their life, if you will, um, and, and get back into school, get back to sleeping, get back to dealing with this stuff. So what we really hope is that we can start to understand what's going on and move it upstream to the point where folks like Jenny who are dealing with three, three-year-olds and five-year-olds are, are seeing the early signs of this and redirecting and helping the parents structure the children's lives and their, their media use so that they don't get to that point where people are tempted to call it addiction. And I would just add to that quickly that the, the guilt and not shame comes from the fact that the word addiction places the problem in the user, in the individual and in the family. And the words we choose to describe a problem carry assumptions with them, right? So if we're only you know, saying this is, a, this is a medical issue, this is in the, the child and the family that's their fault, their problem, it's not addressing the larger digital ecosystem that has a huge role to play. Absolutely, and and it does put blame. I mean, we have we have a punitive approach to addiction, not a therapeutic approach to it. And what what do we know about what impact it's had on kids' brains and long term development? The uh, the reliance on screens and on and on you know on social media interactions rather than real world interactions and creative play. Well, the short answer is not nearly enough. <laughs> Not nearly enough. I mean, we are, we are scrambling to catch up with something that we should be ahead of. And in other aspects of child development and child health, we, we're in much better shape than we are in this. Because for a long time, this has been viewed as social engineering. This has been view, viewed as an issue of First Amendment rights and um, don't get in the way of, of progress and innovation rather than one of, hey, this is changing the world in dramatic ways um, that we need to really understand. And we are in danger of confusing our near infinite connectivity with the connectedness that it is actually undermining and eroding between humans. Great, thank you so much. Now, John, uh, Screened Out premiered just this past week. Has it been, has it, have you been getting a good, a good, a lot of good feedback, a positive feedback loop as it were? Oh yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's pretty crazy. You know, we're doing tons of press interviews right now from my garage, uh, by the <laughs> way. Uh, and uh, yeah, like, like a ton of them. There's been a ton of interest, uh, a lot of emails. We did, we did an online premiere and tons of parents groups and organizations and came on and like we had to shut down the q a like there's so much to it um and that's the thing with making a film like this when you make a film you got to squeeze a lot of information into 71 minutes like you can't you can't i mean we could have made a 10-part netflix series we could have all binged um three and, two one <laughs> yeah, you know but um but that's you know th there's so much information and we just wanted to make it so you know people can take in little bits of it and come out and start a conversation like this at the end of the day. And I think that's what it's doing. And I think, um, you know, it, it's resonating with a lot of people from you know, all levels of society, really, because everyone's kind of dealing with this same issue. Like I said, everyone in my neighborhood, you know, every parent, everyone's looking at this and they're saying, we don't have answers right now. Like, where are the answers? Who's, you know, they're going to common this meeting in these other places, but they're, they're also going, you know, why isn't government giving us the answers we need as well? Well, hopefully we'll get some data and then we'll be in a better position to do that. Did you have something you wanted to add, Jamie, or ask? Well, <clears throat> that last point just made me think about how every kid thinks that his or her childhood is normal. Um, they have nothing to compare it to. And now we have an entire generation that's growing up um, completely seeped in this social media culture and in screen time. I'm just wondering, did, to what extent you think kids themselves, when you talk to them about it, 
are aware that it affects their moods, it affects their learning style, it affects their willingness to go outside and play, it affects their relationships and so on. I mean, we're, we're going to need kids themselves to begin to rebel against it too. Well, that's, the, that's why you need digital citizenship. And that's why literally now yeah, there's courses in mo the majority of American schools um, around it, because that is sort of the education process. And schools are the best place to deliver that, because there's also parent ed that goes along with that. But Jamie, that's exactly right. And I think what you're seeing, particularly, I mean, Jennifer, you said you have teenagers. Teenagers are aware of this. That doesn't mean they necessarily self-regulate appropriately or that their behavior is correct. And they're dealing also with a comparative culture that has been brought to you by Instagram, Snapchat, and others, which has a huge impact on their self-esteem. Um, but I think uh, that kids, at the end of the day, Jamie, kids are the, are, are the I mean, it's such a trite way to put it, but kids are the future. They, we are going to have to educate them. It's why the digital, it's so good you guys have a digital citizenship committee. That's the essence of the field that we've created and of, of, the, and of the curriculum. It's really educating young people about all the different ways in which media and technology shape their lives, and therefore they become the people in control of their own lives. Even though they're dealing with huge megalopolis tech companies who have built in design features that are designed to get them to stay there or use their products in different kinds of ways. So that's why this is such an important discussion, why the work that you and Jennifer are doing is so important. Well, thank you. And Jennifer, I'll just say thanks for putting this together. And uh, thanks uh, to Dr. Rich and Dr. Rudesky for their work and John for putting the film together and Jim for just being such a leader in this movement. And you've given a real push to the Camera Act and let's get this done. Um, let's, let's get it done before the end of this Congress, Jennifer. So we'll, we'll, we'll caucus on how to make it happen. Absolutely, because we're at the point where, where we, we know some, we have some information, but we, don't, we, don't, we still don't know what we don't know except that my dogs are barking at the FedEx guy. <laughs> I'm glad it's your dog. No, they're still, agreeing. Not they're, agreeing with Jamie. they're just echoing what Jamie said. They're agreeing that the bill needs to pass. But, uh, but so, you know, so we still, we still have a lot of information that we need. We have some good tools in order to work on in the meantime. But what, what advice, what, you know, we're going to need to wrap up shortly, but what advice would you all have for parents who don't quite know, you know, where to start? you know, what, what's a good place for them to start in order to be able to be better, more responsible parents when it comes to their kids' consumption uh, and production of digital media? Early childhood before adolescence. Go, Jenny. All right. Um, okay, well, I mean, number one is, is think about it. You know, think about it, talk about it. Uh, have a plan. Don't let it just be this reactive, habit-driven thing that you do throughout the day, because then it's a lot harder to create boundaries around it and know that even in infancy, babies are watching, toddlers are watching, they're learning informally from us. So the more you try to create some health around your relationship with tech, they, that'll, that'll rub off on them too. Um, when it comes to you know, the, the preschool and into school age crowd, I always recommend common sense media and wide open school as you, know, you gotta know where the content is because there's so much guarding, garbage floating out there you need to kind of know where you can find the good stuff because good content really has been shown to improve outcomes um, in young kids. And then also, um, like I said, have a conversation about it. Kids, especially school age, they don't want to be taken advantage of. You know, they, they want to know how they might be being tricked. Um, so I'll have conversations with my 10 year old all the time to be like, what do you think YouTube knows about you? You know, what have they gathered about you just from your, your viewing behavior or, you know, were you supposed to be doing work now? Why do you have like 10 tabs up that are all about Star Wars? We have to help kids reflect upon their relationship with technology, how it makes them feel, how it scatters their brains sometimes. So those conversations are crucial and parents, you're not going to do anything perfectly. So just try your best and be open, not judgmental and help kids recognize when tech might be messing with them a little bit. Great, thank you so much, John. How about you? How, how about from your experience with your film? Do you have any advice for parents who, who don't know quite where to start dealing with this issue? Well, I mean, you know, there's the whole device-free Sundays and things like that you can do, which we do around my house. You know, and there's a lot of resources like Common Sense Media everywhere else about how to regulate your kid's screen time. But I will say that um, a thing around our house is, you know, parents put the phone down. You know, your kids are watching you. So when you tell your kids you can't have screen time till four and you're sitting there on the couch all day doing this, your kids are looking at you and saying, well, this is okay. This is an acceptable way to behave. So 
uh, I'm just going to do it. Or that's what I want to be like. And that's what I want to do. You're your kids' greatest role models. I mean, Jim said that in the film. And, um, and that's so true. So, you know, on a Sunday saying, you know, just don't do cold turkey and, you know, turn your phone off for two days. It's not going to happen. You know, start small, do three hours, go for a walk, leave your phone at home and go for a walk with your kids and pay attention to them. Great. That's and, wonderful. And, and I would say um, we also have to change our attitude from good and bad to what is optimal for children. When we do the good, bad thing, um, we get caught in the I'm doing it wrong, I'm feeling guilty, etc. And, and we need to take a step back. And for example, the concept of parental controls. Um, I have a problem with just the terminology because there's no kid in the world who wants to be controlled by their parent. But if we changed our attitude and made it about parental engagement and, and working together to create a better environment, um, sit down next to your kid who's playing Fortnite and maybe play with him and understand what is going on for him. And, and that tells him a couple of things. It tells him you respect him, you love him, you want, you're interested in what engages him. But it also allows you to enter into his world as his student, if you will, um, in learning Fortnite. Um, and then you can start to inject in some of the executive function stuff like, okay, now I finally figured out how to, you know, try to survive um, all these people shooting at me by shooting at them. Let's talk a little bit about why you might want to do that. And so I think that it's a matter of approaching it with an openness and a humility and not a police action, but as, as, as one of really trying to understand our child. And, and one of the things that can help with this is actually we just released last week the Family Digital Wellness Guide, which approaches the cycle of life from infancy right through to adolescence with how the child is developing, what issues uh, in which they interact with media affect them in positive and negative ways, and ideas for how to deal with it, including right up to how do I start a conversation about sexting or cyberbullying or, or violent videos. So um, I, I would offer that to, to you and to the community as, as something that can start as a primer for how to live with these media, but to do it with humility and frankly, a sense of humor. And where, and where would we find that, that fantastic guide, which I'm going to be looking up as soon as I get off the... <laughs> um, at, on, on the Center, for, on Center on Media and Child Health website, which is cmch.tv. Um, and there is an introductory DIY video. It's, it's, it's right there. It's available to all for free. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Rich. And Jim, relatedly, I know that some Common Sense Media has a lot of great resources for, for parents as well. So any, any last words of advice? Sure, use Common Sense. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well said. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. This was a fan. You. you had a great panel. You guys got some awesome people here. John, congrats on your film. And I Jennifer, know. keep it up. We will pass camera, but thank you for your leadership in the house. It makes a kind of huge difference. Thank you. Thanks for having us about the task force and everything we're going to be doing this was really wonderful and i'm going to toss it to jamie for closing remarks because i got to lead us off so i'm going to let you close us out thank you jennifer um well we've got a fantastic uh, documentary movie now um to teach everybody about the importance of our focusing on this as a society and the camera act uh, is a tiny bit of money that will give us the research we need to make informed public health and child development recommendations to the country about how to manage the new social media environment we're in. So I'm very cheered and uplifted by the conversation. You guys are a silver lining in uh, all of the gloomy news that we've been getting. And uh, Jennifer, I look forward to working with you as soon as we get back to the house to campaign with our colleagues to give it that final push we need. But I do think we're up over 80 uh, co-sponsors now. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you guys. Thank you so Thank you. much for having us. See you in the future. Thanks for joining Thank us. Take care. Stay well, everybody. Well, yeah. Thank you.